was thinking through this in between services, I really felt like the Lord was saying that this word is specifically for this congregation. Not that I don't think it wasn't beneficial to the first service also, but um, I'm just very aware that I, I think God wants to use this, this word. Every one of us, I'm guessing in here, at least once, if not many, many times, has been in a situation, and we honestly ask, where is God? Not that we think he somehow vanished, and theologically we even know that he's present in all things, but we're like, where are you in this situation? Because I don't see it. And sometimes it makes us despair, sometimes it makes us angry, frustrated, it strengthens our unbelief at times. And so this morning's message, I'm hoping to draw out a bunch of different examples and scriptures to help us see how he is present in everything we go through, in every situation we go through, whether we, we can visibly see and feel him or not, because he has made a covenant with us to do so. And how our believing in faith that he is there can help strengthen us and enable us to see where he is and interact with him in that process. But I want to start with a reminder from Psalm 139, because it seems really possible that uh, King David was feeling this way, and he wrote this psalm where he's crying out to God, and he's kind of just, you can almost hear the argument going back and forth in his mind, where he says, oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know everything about me. You know when I'm sitting down, you know when I get up, you know when I'm thinking, you can, you even discern when I'm going to go out, even before I go out, you discern when I'm going to lie down. You're familiar, Lord, with all of my ways, my activities. You're familiar with who I am. Before a word was even on my tongue, you knew what I was going to say. And Lord, there are times that you just hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me, and, and this knowledge is too wonderful for me to even understand. And so he culminates this by saying, so where can I go from your spirit? Can you hear the rhetorical question there? And so with what I know, where can I flee from your presence? Because if I go up to the highest of heavens, you're there. If I, if I decide to go down to the deepest, darkest depths, wherever that may be, you're there also. If I decide to take off and rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand, it will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. Which means, no matter what direction we decide to run in with our life, He is always there to redirect us back in the right place. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Because a lot of the times, our wandering is very self-inflicted. And then he, he sums it up by saying, you know what? If I think to myself, surely if I go into the darkest place, there I'll be okay, and I'll be away from you. But it says that you make the light become, or the, the night becomes like light around me when you show up. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And he summarizes by saying, so I praise you, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are, are wonderful. I know them full well. And this thought process goes on throughout the Scriptures, and I certainly didn't highlight all of them, but just a, a few to remind us. In Hebrews 13.5, we're reminded by the author that God says, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. No matter what you do, no matter how far you or I try to run, no how much we struggle with understanding what God's doing or even unbelief in the situation, he says, I will not leave you and I will not forsake you. In Matthew, the very, very last sentence he writes are Jesus' words. He says, no, know this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As I mentioned to you, <laughs> this is the Easter season. And we left last Sunday. Doesn't Easter seem like it was a month away? Hard to believe. A few hours ago, I was at your place hanging out. You know, it, just, it seems like forever away. And I, I think about this, how they were at the empty tomb, and I shared with you on Sunday morning how John made sure to write that he wrote fast, ran faster than Peter, and they went to the tomb, and we found out others followed behind them, and they were all there. It was the empty tomb. They didn't know what to do with it. They fully didn't even understand the idea of what resurrection meant. And we learned that over time, Peter, John, the others, they just started to go back home, confused, not sure what to make of it, 
But we're told in, in the book of John that one person stayed behind. It was Mary Magdalene. And we're told in the book of Mark something about Mary Magdalene. And that's at some point in her life, she was possessed by evil spirits. And that at some point in her life, Jesus came along and drove seven evil spirits out of her life. You can certainly understand how that would build a connection with somebody, right? And so she's just staying at the tomb, having, having known what this man did to resurrect her life even before he rose again. And she's just there, and all of a sudden, she hears someone talking behind her. And, and we think that once, you know, the angel told them at the tomb, everybody was like, woo, he rose again. No, they still didn't get it. Just like there's times in our life where we feel, where's God? I still don't get it, what you're doing. And so she's there on the ground just wondering, and she hears this voice, and she thinks it's the gardener. And she doesn't understand the concept of resurrection. She says, look, look, where'd you take the body? Did you take the body? I'll go get it. I want to put incense on it. I want to honor the man who changed my life. And she looked at him, and the Bible says she didn't even recognize him at first until this one incredible moment when Jesus looks right at her, and he says her name. He says, Mary. And her eyes are opened, and she sees her Savior. And so the first point I want to drive home for us this morning is that when peace comes to us in our times of distress and even fear, because Jesus comes and he calls your name, he calls my name in that place, it may take a season. Remember, all the others, they were there a while and all, all the others eventually went back and she was just there broken. And when he spoke her name, it changed everything. And not long after, as Scotty read for us, that evening, after Mary had come back and told everybody what, what had happened and they were confused but excited and there's this mix of emotions not knowing where is Jesus? Where is he? On the evening, it says, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. This was an intense situation. Thinking at any moment, actually, they probably wouldn't even knock. They'd probably just blast through the door and come and take them all away. And it says, while the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And he didn't give a sermon. He didn't come at them because of their unbelief. He looked right at the group and he said, peace be with you. And later on, as Scott, he read, he'll say it again. Because sometimes it takes God speaking a few things to us before we get it. And can you imagine all of the fear, all of the depression, the sex, because Jesus showed up in that moment. And what's interesting is, can you imagine, I, I, I truly, sometimes there's people in the Bible and you just feel so bad for them. Because all the apostles are there, the women are there, they're all there, and they're all excited, and what's happening? And poor Thomas went out for a Mountain Dew, and he comes back, and he finds out, why? Well, what happened? I missed it? What's going on here? That's my translation, by the way. But he comes back, and they're like, we just saw Jesus. And he was in the same place they were in just a little bit ago. And he's thinking, how could I, I can't believe that this is true. And every one of us have been in a situation where we've gotten news, and until we get more information, we can't believe it's true. Right? And so Thomas is standing there, and he says, I can't believe it unless I, unless I and he, he goes to the extreme. Unless I can touch his holes in his hand, unless I can touch the hole in his side, I just can't believe it. And I, I'm just going to say, what, what do we know Thomas as in our modern culture? Doubting Thomas. I think that is, I'll use the nice church term, bunk, okay? Because how would you or I like to be known by the sins that we've committed? Hey, there's old greedy Matt. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get him. Woo! There's that gossiping Russell. Woo! Oh, you know about, how would we like to be known by that? Did Jesus ever call him Doubting Thomas? No, he met him where he was at. He stood there, and he appeared right before Thomas, and he didn't say, oh, you unbelieving sinner. No, he came to him. And, said, and this was, understand, it says a week later. So he, for a whole week, having to hear about how you missed it. Th take a moment. 
I'm going to say, if I'm in that situation, I'm thinking I must have been unworthy for God to have shown up when I was there. Can you see how that could, you could think that way? How I, I'm not deserving enough to have seen him. I mean, these, these guys are all talking about it, right? It's this amazing moment, life-changing moment, and he didn't get to be part of it. <laughs> but talk about leaving no man behind. Jesus shows up a week later and says, he says to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands, reach out, stop doubting, and believe. And Thomas' next words, my Lord and my God. It just took, just took him hearing, calling his name, and saying, I've not forgotten you. I've not given up on you. You are still part of my plan, Thomas. And I, I forget the exact how, because I, I, I mix up the disciples sometimes. But I know that Thomas, at some point, went and preached the gospel and gave his life as a martyr's sacrifice for the Christ that he loved. So I'd say he moved past doubting Thomas, wouldn't you? And so Jesus said, because you have seen me and believed, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. That's us. That there's a special blessing when we trust that he is still there with us, even when we feel absolutely lost and confused and we cannot figure out why he doesn't seem to show up the way we want him to. And so Jesus is with us as a peace giver in our distress and fear. He's as a peace giver bringing peace in our unbelief and our failure. And he's also a giver of peace in our hopelessness and when we're in horrific, troubling situations. And for this one, I'm just going to jump outside of the, the gospel narrative for a moment and touch on a story about that you may remember. I'm going to go back, just give you the 30-second short version that there were two brothers, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob tricked and manipulated his older brother Esau out of his birthright. He tricked and manipulated him out of his blessing. And Esau was enraged and was ready to kill his brother. So Jacob's mom sent him away. Now, when we read about places in the Bible, we don't always discern the distance. She sent him to her brother who lived 450 miles away. They were not driving a Porsche to get there. That's a long, lonely walk. As he's thinking about all the things he did, and he goes to this, this, this brother-in-law named Laban, and if you know the story, for 20 years, he's manipulating and tricking Jacob, just like Jacob tricked his brother, and, and in the process, he, he got himself not one wife, but two, and in the end, he just had to get out of there. And we've all been in places that we just have to get out of. And so he says, I'm going back home. And how far is back home? 450. That's not like, let's take the weekend and get back home. They're traveling, and they're traveling, and they're traveling until they finally get near home. And he gets word that his brother Esau is coming with an army. Now, the last time he saw Esau, he had threatened and declared that he was going to kill him. And he was now in this situation where there was nowhere else to go. Because you could say he could run. Well, he had not one wife, but two. And so you got two people to tell you the right direction to go. Just kidding, it was a joke. But you have all the wives, you got all the kids, you got all the, the, the stuff, that the, the animals and all the stuff. They are not out running Esau and his army, correct? And so he is stuck. And so he does what he tries to do. He thinks, okay, I'm going to split my stuff. I'm going to put some of it over here, some of it over here, because then maybe if Esau attacks one group, the other group can get away. He's trying to figure out what to do, knowing that it's a hopeless situation, and that there is no real answer. Because Esau could easily wipe out one group and go get the other one, take all his stuff he ever had and leave him dead. And so he sends a group ahead, and then he goes alone, and he crosses over a small river called the Jabbok. And that, that name in Hebrew, the Jabbok River, means one who wrestles or engages with God. That's what that word means. And he goes there, and he, I don't know if it was a giant mountain, but he goes up a ways, and he just plops down for the night, and he starts crying out to God. And he says, Lord, you've given me all of these blessings. You've built a covenant with me. I've built altars to honor you. What am I going to do? And we read about this weird moment in Scripture where this, this man shows up and he starts wrestling with Jacob. Now we learn later that this man was actually God incarnate in, the very, in, that, in that man at that moment. And so he's actually wrestling with God. 
And we read. Now, this is a really strange thing. Think, I'll give you a second to try to figure out how this makes sense. He's wrestling with God, and it says he defeated God. How does that work? You're like, please tell me, Matt. I will. What's that? God let him win. And how about drawing us over to the resurrection? You tell me when Jesus... Though he had been beaten and thrown upon a cross, could he at any moment have called down a legion of angels to destroy everyone who drew breath in that region? Yet he willingly let himself humble, humble to a death on a cross. And that same God, as he's wrestling with Jacob, knowing that what he's doing is creating humility in Jacob, and Jacob finally, finally is winning, but then the angel says, like, or, or God's like, I gotta go. And he says, I'm not going to let you go. Do you hear that? Don't get lost. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And he's holding on and holding on, and God then just touches his hip, boom, dislocates the hip, and he's still holding on. And he says, I don't care what else happens to me. I will not let go until you bless me. God gives him a new name. He says, no longer is your name Jacob, which can mean deceiver, but your now, name is now Israel, one who has wrestled with God and won. And in that moment, he realizes what had just happened. And he calls that place Peniel, which doesn't mean anything to us when we read it, but that's the Hebrew word for the face of God. And he said, in that darkest moment, when utter, not just destruction and defeat, but loss of life was about to happen for everything God had given me, he showed up, gave me a new name, and I refused to let him go until I got his blessing. And so know that God is not only there for us in our times of distress and fear. He is not only there for us as the giver of peace when we have unbelief and failure, but he's the God who gives us peace in hopeless and troubling situations. And then finally, the story that I thought really connected well. <laughs> Do you remember the story about the woman who had been <laughs> diseased and broken inside for 12 years with an issue of blood. A woman who had tried every single doctor there was. Every kind of medicine. Every time hoping that next, that next appointment, that next medicine might heal her, might help her. Because she was now shunned by society. Because if, if you have the issue of blood, you can't be amongst regular society. And here is this woman who hears that Jesus is going to be present. And we read that he's coming down through the crowds. And the crowds are so thick. Now, I realize a lot of you can't relate to this, but if you've ever been to a giant rock concert, and you want to get up front to what they call the pit, all right? You got to go through volumes of people, many of which are quite big <laughs> and quite aggressive. And you have to work your way through it. It's almost impossible. Can you imagine this, this feeble woman, this woman who has almost no strength left in her body, probably bowed over like this as she goes, manipulating and working her way through the crowd because she just has to touch Jesus. And when that kind of faith connects with his kind of power, friends, something miraculous happens. And she just reached out. Who knows? She may have even fallen on the ground and just swiped at his garment as he went by. And he said, who touched me because I felt power go out from me? And the woman, after 12 years of suffering, I want to highlight that because in the modern Christianity, you act like, oh, just come to the altar. Boom, 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 everything's fixed and we go home perfect, right? No, sometimes there is a long, drawn-out period where we scream, where is God? But God had reserved that moment to glorify His Son and bless this woman in that mighty interchange where she touched Him and she was made whole. And she was now the living embodiment of a testimony of the power of Jesus Christ. And if we are truly calling Him Lord, it means as much as we don't have to wish it or want it or care to have it, we have to allow Him to use our lives in a way that we decrease and He increases. I don't mean to come on. Well, actually, I guess I do come on. This is something God has been working in me the last few weeks. That we cannot judge our lives by any other means than are we honoring Him through His strength, with the best of what we have. And when we don't, are we repentant so we can get right back in and do it again? Because He's worthy of that. 
But there are moments amidst the struggle and the war and the challenges that he, that he just shows. Well, he's always there, but he reveals himself more. I don't like shows up because he's always present. He reveals himself more where we just know that he cares for us and he's walking that path with us. Last very, very, very brief point. There are times in our lives, though, that we feel very victorious where things go well, where we believe God is honored by what we do. I know when Bianca and the team played Easter last week, all I did was write our text. I wrote something like, wow, thank you. Boom, that was the whole text. So it, just, it, was, it was just a moment where you knew God was using them to bless us and bring us close to him. And there are those moments, and I was reminded of that moment that you might be familiar with where Moses had died and just, or Joshua was, was about to be made the captain of a hundreds of thousands of people. And God shows up to him and says, first of all, I want you to be strong and courageous, and, I will, and you will lead these people into the inheritance I have for them. So there's the promise. But then he goes on to say, be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you and go with you wherever you go. In Philippians, we're given that great verse, the peace of Christ, which goes beyond our understanding. And <laughs> it sounds so good and so simple, but sometimes it's hard to believe beyond our understanding. Let's not, be, let's not be churchy. It's often hard to believe beyond our understanding. Really. But he says that his peace is promised beyond our understanding. And I want to give you one last kind of fun little illustration. So just stick with me for about one more minute. There was a, a game this year in, in college football between, you don't have to like sports to like this, but there's a game between Michigan and Ohio State, one of the great rivalries in all of sports. And, and Michigan and, and Ohio State were in this tight battle. And Michigan had this one player who, who was a giant offensive guard. We'll probably go number one in, in the draft, or not number one, but in the first round of the draft this year. Huge player, but he was the motivational leader. He, he was the head of the team. Everyone looked up to him. He's what drove the machine that made him go. And halfway through the game, there was a moment where, I forget if it was a snap leg or, a dis or it was his knee, but he just went down. And in that giant stadium of 109,000 people, you could hear a pin drop. And as the guy's lying on the ground, you look at the Michigan sideline, and they look like the literal life had been just stolen out of them. Of all the players that could have gone down, Zach Minter could not go down, but he did. And as they watched him, and they picked up his body and put it on the cart, as you've seen them do in sports, as they quickly put an air cast over his leg, and they're pumping up that air cast, all of a sudden, all around the stadium of over 100,000 people, you hear, let's go, Zach. Let's go, Zach. And they just start cheering it louder and louder. And, and the announcer's talking about how it feels like the entire place is shaking with the volume of their cheers. And as he goes off, he raises his hand, and they all explode in victory. And no kidding, in the next play, the guy who came in to fill his position, they did a running play over that, and he ran for a 20-yard touchdown, which eventually led to a, a, a Michigan victory. And I want you to know that as you and I struggle, as we wake up and we feel the weight of life, and as it seems like it keeps striking us over and over, there's a chorus of those in heaven who have gone before us saying your name. Let's go, Billy. Let's go, Beth. Let's go, Austin. Just saying our name over, cheering us on. I'm not trying to be silly. I'm trying to be utterly serious. Cheering us on to victory. And one day... If the Lord waits on for his second coming, we're going to be part of that team. And this past week, as one of our good brothers, Chuck Kennard, went to be with the Lord, and the weight of that hits, we remember that he stands before the throne of God, and he now cheers us on to see God's kingdom come in this world. And that chorus of believers and the chorus of angels is behind us, encouraging us and calling your name and saying, don't forget the Prince of Peace is with you wherever you go, whatever you're struggling with. He has not left you. And together we join together and we say, Amen. Amen, Lord Jesus. Thank you for being with us and cheering us forward. And so as we, we move forward this morning, and as we eventually leave this place, God is cheering for you 
The saints are cheering for you. The angels are cheering for you to see God's kingdom come. There was this neat little Facebook post, and it said, the Apostle Paul entered into heaven to the ruckus roars of those who he persecuted. That's how the kingdom works. That even those who we have maybe messed up in the past with, they go on to be with him. They are for us, cheering us forward as we celebrate what he will do and is doing in our lives. No, he has not left you or forsaken you. He is your God. Amen.